a fellow cycling family and friends. I just want to tell you how gorgeous you are today and I hope you have the most amazing week. Now it's December and I hope you have your gear list ready and sent off to Santa. You're a woman, this is totally for you. The four week cycling skills workshop benefits all women. These skills can be implemented immediately on the bike and trainer, cycling outside, indoor cycling, on a spin bike or peloton. All your current frustrations and questions will be answered guaranteed. If you're interested in joining me, don't wait another moment. With this link, you can get started at the beginning of each month. I know you're trying to decide whether or not to check out the four week cycling skills workshop for women, but I don't blame you. There are so many other online cycling training platforms that offer cycling routes and training sessions, but they're but here's what makes my four week cycling skills workshop different. First of all, it's taught by someone who's not just starting out, but actually has is pretty experienced. I've been working with free clients in my cycling club, Cycle Fit Chicks, all the way to Canadian national female cyclists. And I continuously update my coaching tactics to help beginner to advanced cyclists level up with these cycling techniques hardly anyone is talking about. Secondly, the four week cycling skills workshop for women is so much more. A lot of times there are online cycling training programs that teach you how to train intensely, but don't, don't, but actually don't help you develop the fundamental cycling skills and techniques such as gear management, hill climbing, strength, power and speed, and nutritional timing in order to effectively become a faster, fitter, and more efficient cyclist and well-rounded athlete. And also, there are very few courses about cycling that actually teach you how to develop a smooth, efficient pedal stroke. The Four Week Cycling Skills Workshop for Women aims to fill both these gaps in the cycling in cycling training, not to mention the workshop provides the recordings of the explanations, demonstrations, plus homework. In addition, you will gain access to a library of over 100 strength training workouts to help you level up, and that is all on top of the core curriculum you already get when you join the workshop. So it's safe to say I'm delivering incredible results coaching over a thousand female cyclists through my cycling club and now it's even more exciting to impact more female cyclists globally through my four-week cycling skills workshop for women. You can't go wrong when you join a workshop developed by a woman for women. It's time to level up and remove the frustrations. So if you're ready to join, just click the link that you see and secure your spot today in one of the next four week cycling skills workshops for women's sessions. Now before the new year with um, this amazing deal, a 25, 25% off until December 31st. Limited spots available. Don't wait another minute. Click the link and roll today. And I can't wait to see you on the inside. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Secrets from the Saddle All Things Cycling Podcast with your host, Sylvie Dow here, sitting in beautiful Chelsea, Quebec, Canada. And her guest, my guest today, is Joey Schwartz. Now, he is coming from the, the greater GTA area in Toronto, and he's going to be talking to us about ARC. Now, ARC in the Toronto area is an or it's an advocacy for respect for cyclists. So we're going to be learning a lot about this particularly particular organization in the Toronto area before but before we bring uh Joey out and you know find out all the goods this is what uh, he's been up to. So Joey Cycles um is his main Joey Cycles as his main form of transportation since two, 1970 which was the year I was born. <laughs> I'm not dating ourselves here or anything, but <laughs> um, his Toronto urban cycling experience started in early 1990s. Um, he was also, he is also an endurance cycling cyclist riding up to 400 kilometers a day. And we call those people randoneers. And I've come across a couple of them and they are just long distance cyclists. And 
from what I understand, and maybe this is true for you, Joey, is I had a friend who was doing this, but she went to Europe to participate in this like 600 kilometer race. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's like from Paris to something else. And you have to log all these kilometers before you even can enter. No, that's like a sidebar thing. But that's that was my experience with Randon years and a friend of mine who's doing that. Um, over the years, he's also been a director of touring for the Toronto Bicycle Network, the TBA, TBN. For, and for over seven years, he's taught and coordinated CAN Bike at the city of Toronto. So we might touch a, a bit on that as well. That's, that's uh, cycling instruction. He teaches everyone from adult beginners to teenagers uh, needing can bike level four to working to work for uh, level four to work for the city. He also is a bike law ambassador working on changing Ontario laws as they relate to cycling. Is also a member of the advocacy for respect for cyclists and helps organize ghost bike memorial rides for fallen cyclists in the city. Welcome, Joey. Sounds like you're super busy. Yes, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Uh, on that side note, um, yeah, we do have a, every four years for the brand years, uh, we have our grand brevet and it's uh, called Paris Brest Paris Ride. And believe it or not, it's 1200 kilometers. We have 90 hours to do that. 90 hours? Yes. There was one guy from Paris? Canada the last time did it in 48 hours. 48 hours. Oh, yeah. Anyways, my, my mind is blown. Okay. Does anybody re realize how many? I have had uh, friends who she did a 11 or maybe it was a 1200 um, kilometer event in, uh, in the UK. But it took her like four days. <laughs> they, they had a little bit more time <laughs> to do it. But anyways, that is uh, extreme. Just a little bit out of my uh, comfort zone. But Joey, before like we get into the goods, I always love to ask how you got into cycling. Um, well, uh, how I got into urban cycling in Toronto in the 1990s was simply a TTC strike. That's the Toronto Transit Commission. So we didn't have buses or subways for about a week in the summer of 1991. I borrowed a friend's bike on a, at that time, my main form of transportation was either transit or walking. And so I took a bike, a friend's bike, to uh, a commute that I needed to do that I would normally do on transit. And I was shocked at how easy it was to do it in downtown <laughs> Toronto. So after that, I got, I got a bike and started cycling all the time. So. Um, for me, that's how I got into it. And then uh, as I got fitter and fitter cycling, then I had friends who were doing real cycling and in terms of um, organized cycling and clubs and so forth. So I started doing longer and longer rides. Eventually, uh, I found doing uh, the Toronto Bicycling Network's hair shirt ride, which is 322 kilometers in one day from uh, Toronto down to Niagara Falls and back. Um, did that a couple of times. I'm like, well, hey, I can do 300 k there's this club called the Randomers. They sound like they uh, might be fun. And so I started doing uh, their rides. Oh my God, it sounds like... Okay, so when you go to Toronto, when you go from to Niagara Falls, is there like a trail or are you on like back roads? Back roads mostly. Back roads, okay. I was wondering if there's like a rail trail that was down there that they there opened are up. Are rail trails sort of around there? Um, like there's a one on the Welland Canal, uh, but there's no direct rail track. There is um, sort of the um, the um, Trans Canada Trail, but some of that's like you're on the so you're on like a service road of uh, the QEW, the Queen Elizabeth Line. Um, <laughs> okay. So it's <laughs> and we do do some of that on the hair shirt or even on some of the Rainier rides in that general area. Uh, actually, I prefer the Rainier rides in that area, but. Uh, the TBN ride's still pretty good, and that's usually the beginning, that's the entry point for a lot of people to come into long distance during cycle, is the, uh, the hair shirt. Yeah, it's like, a, do you do that over the weekend, or is that like a full day? It's a full day, on a, usually on a Sunday, usually um, the closest day to the um, longest day of the year. Right, that so makes sense. <laughs> 
of course, it's right in here. I, I'm used to cycling, you know, all at like three o'clock in the morning because, you know, a hub generator uh, guiding my lights and so forth. Okay, so, we should be, maybe you should get into that after a hub <laughs> generator. Now, anyways, that kind of dates me to back when I was a kid and there was that generator that uh, it's added, like it pushes against the frame, not the frame, right. the rim, and it generates your light. Is that, is that, is that These are improved. It's improved. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, so uh, instead of being on the sidewall, it's actually in the hub. So in the front hub of the bike, um, there's actually a dynamo. And um, it causes a little bit more resistance than, say, a, you know, an Altegra um, hub. But still, I mean, for, I don't know. Is it, I mean, I'm not a racer, though. So um, for me, it might slow me down. Instead of doing a kilo, you know, 100 kilometers in, let's say, um, four hours, I might do it in 4.10 hours. It's, huh. it's kind of middle. It's probably easier to have that on your bike over like the head, the light, and like dealing with all of the batteries and everything. That's what I'm imagining. Oh, oh yeah. And I can even, um, I even have a USB uh, tap to it. So I can charge, let's say, my bike computer or uh, even my iPhone or whatever while I'm cycling. <laughs> okay, this is a whole other subject that we should probably dive into later on, like okay. on another episode, but <laughs> because I've got like so many things going on, but we're here to talk about the advocacy and respect for cyclists arc organization. Do you want to talk how does how did that get started? And what Well, ARC got started in 1996, and it got started wow. mostly by, by couriers and people who were trying to do sort of like um, rides to open the streets to make the streets safer for cyclists. And eventually what happened was one of those rides, um, the police came down very heavily on the group because it was a Friday night and they were, they didn't have any kind of parade permit or anything like that. And they just took over Spadina. Uh, from basically uh, the lake shore all the way up to Bloor Street. So it was a slow ride of maybe about 600 people just riding. Um, and uh, one of those people got arrested. So ERC got formed to get the, uh, to help do the support for this person. Then gradually ARC started moving into things like advocacy for uh, changing bike laws and so forth, because a lot of people started to die. Um, in the late 1990s uh, on the streets, more than we, we were seeing before uh, while they were cycling. And of course, more people were cycling. Um, ultimately, they started getting involved with the ghost bikes, putting up the ghost bike memorials in 2006. Because on the 20th of April, uh, 2006, two cyclists died in separate uh, collisions. Um, so a week later, uh, ARC, the same person still makes the uh, bikes today, Jeffrey Bearbridge, um, built the bikes and they had a memorial ride, two separate memorial rides on that same day. And ever since then, we've been doing uh, these ghost bike memorial rides. Wow. So what else does ARC do? Because when I, um, so Pat Brown connected us and he said, ARC is a really big organization within Toronto and quite, um, aff not affluent, but like quite, um, I guess they have a big voice. Have they grown to that extent well, where mean, a there's a lot of cross pollination between different groups? I mean, I, as you can tell, I'm already a member of four or five different groups. So, um, and most of the people in our are not just in art. So, a lot of us uh, are involved in other forms of advocacy. Um, you know, again, uh, because you mentioned Patrick, I mean, I work as a uh, as a bike law ambassador. So, one of our big things was trying to get. Uh, the Ontario government to um, bring in vulnerable road user laws. Well, ARC supports that, and several of us who are in ARC also are in other groups like Bike Law or uh, Cycle Toronto or other groups that actually are advocates, uh, doing advocacy for that. Um, and again, for us, vulnerable road users is probably politically one of the big things that we're really, really fighting for. Now, of course, the latest bill, Bill 62, just died on the table uh, in early September because um, Premier Ford prorogued government. So once he prorogues the government, the bill has to be readmitted. And since we're going to have an election next June, it's not likely we're going to have um, any of this happening 
in the near future. Hopefully, uh, this time next year, we can see a similar bill to Bill 62 reintroduced, and uh, we'll be heavily advocating for that. In the meantime, uh, we are also very much involved in local um, politics, in, in the sense that we're involved in local advocacy around bike lanes, uh, about safety, and so forth. And uh, it, it never stops. And the, the weird thing is, is this year and last year to a certain extent too, uh, we've had fewer deaths, yet we've had significantly more people cycling, um, yeah. which is good. And we've gotten more um, bike infrastructure, protected bike infrastructure. So what the city has been doing mostly in the last little while, they've been upgrading former uh, painted bike lanes and turning them into protected bike lanes or uh, also known as cycle tracks. So I mean, we're generally uh, in agreement with that at ARC. Uh, at times we offer criticism when we see a stupid piece of infrastructure go in or a dangerous piece of infrastructure. Um, but for the most part, you know, we, we like- Somebody what, has some to say about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, oh, I mean, it's good that they do infrastructure, but sometimes when they do it, um, it can actually make matters worse. Uh, at one point, uh, the thing I can remember is that at one point they were trying to introduce a protected bike lane, but it was a bi-directional on a two-way street, and it just didn't make any sense. Uh, it probably would have actually caused more collisions between drivers and uh, cyclists than it would have uh, prevented them. Because, uh, and that's the experience of Montreal. That's why Montreal is uh, replacing most of their bi-directionals uh, with separate with same direction bike lanes. Or if it's uh, on a one-way street, then they're putting in concrete lanes. But they're not doing bi-directionals for the time. Yeah, that's like Ottawa. They've got the concrete blocks. At first, it was like a big problem. Like the problem because, you know, I mean, but I guess it's it's when, you know, both motorists and cyclists have to start getting familiar and used to seeing and being able to maneuver around it and use it effectively. But before we move on, can you explain a little bit more about Bill 62? So Bill 62 was the Boundary Road Users Act. Uh, it was introduced by Boundary Jessica Road Bell. Users? What's the act? Sorry, the Vulnerable Road Users Act. Vulnerable. Okay. Uh, Perfect. B-U-R. Oh, sorry, B-R. Um, <laughs> and um, anyways, it was introduced by MPP Jessica Bell, uh, private member's bill. Um, and what it covered essentially was making sure things that people seem to think is you know, they take for granted that that doesn't actually happen um so let's say you're charged your driver you're charged with killing someone you do not have to appear in court your representative can be there so they connect they may not hear uh the testimony from let's say the family uh explaining well you know um this is how this death has impacted our lives it might be very emotional and yeah they they don't have to be there so that's one of the things that it brings in um, another big thing that it brings in is making sure that drivers, uh, if they're convicted of uh, killing someone, that they automatically lose their license for a period of time, um, anywhere from a year to five years. Third, if they're going to uh, regain a license, they must go through driver education again, not simply just be able to go and get a license. Um, so there's an element of education and also community service. We, we really hope that if someone's convicted of killing someone, uh, especially if it's something like drinking, driving, um, or distracted driving, which seems to be uh, a bigger factor these days. Mm -hmm. But again, they go into the community, uh, teach that that's a bad thing, and learn why that was a mistake in their own case. So that's the kinds of things we're looking for in the vulnerable road users. There's more to it than that, but uh, oh, that's yeah. the main thing. <laughs> yeah. So you're hoping to bring that back after next year's election? Bring it yes. back to the table? Cool. Yeah. So either right. uh, if Jessica gets reelected or um, there's another government uh, elected, uh, we'll, um, we'll hopefully get brought back up again. Right. So explain um, how the CAM bike works. So like we talked about it, it's a little bit, I mean, off from ARC. ARC is so advocacy for respect for cyclists. And is there anything more we can you can tell us about that before we move on to can bike? Yeah, uh, um, there's sort of there's some interplay too with can bike. I mean, one of the things that we looked at most of the um, 
a lot of the early people who were really, I wasn't an early person involved with that. Some of the people who were involved with ARC at its beginning uh, were mostly uh, bike couriers and so forth. And they had their own sense of how the flow of traffic should work. Uh, I come from a defensive cycling point of view, uh, shall we say, coming from Canberra. And you see, when <laughs> we, we can both, both the, um, I'd say both the uh, couriers and myself can agree on a lot of bad, what could be bad in like infrastructure. And it comes down to some of the basic principles that we have in Canva. So see, be seen, be predictable. And quite often when bike infrastructure prevents that, then that's usually bad bike infrastructure. And that's why the bi-directional lane, for instance, that I was talking about um, made no sense because it broke off three. It didn't make cyclists predictable because they're going the wrong way. Um, they couldn't be seen necessarily. So the car was making a left turn. They didn't necessarily see the cyclist deep there and fought, or even a right turn. And then finally, um, quite often, these are protected by parked cars. And depending on the size of the car, if it's a truck, panel van or a, something like that, you can't see as well. So you don't know if there's a car ready to turn to that intersection. So it's, within that arc, has a lot of people who, um, who are actually far more versed in um, traffic design than I am, um, and they go over a lot of this stuff. So they go to the they go to a lot of these meetings, and they're constantly monitoring what the city's doing, and they're reviewing the plans, and telling the rest of us in our oh, okay, yeah, this looks like it's good. Oh, I might be a little dicey there, and that kind of stuff. So our you know, goes through that. Does the city of does this sorry does the city of Toronto um uh um What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, work with you, or do you work with them, or do they ask your advice on certain no. new <laughs> infrastructure? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Whoa. What? No, probably. Not. <laughs> I mean, it's like, excuse me, that's um, I don't know who designed that, but. <laughs> well, I also have to be careful too, since I'm a city employee. Um, yeah, and no. you think you you assume oh well you know you're in charge of Canada for the city they would contact me and say hey what do you think of this they don't to be on the project or maybe the project lead or something yeah, I, I i we basically have this wall we're in two completely separate departments i'm in parks forestry and recreation they're in transportation services and we rarely meet <laughs> ah such disconnect it's so weird eh yeah. so Let's talk about can bike. And you're just telling me, uh, Joey, that some things have changed. And um, but tell me about this program that they have or had in in um, in Toronto. And you and mentioned that it's kind of separate and different over here in Ottawa. Yeah. So in Toronto, uh, can bike is. Um, it's run by the, well, it's run by the city of Toronto. It actually originated from the city of Toronto uh, back in the 1990s. It's a combination of uh, one of our police officers, uh, Sergeant Smith, and a few people from the Transportation Services uh, Department that the city of Toronto came up with the whole program. Um, essentially what the program is, besides teaching people who don't know how to ride a bike at all, you can go from complete beginner up to people who um, have advanced beyond beginner, but aren't still comfortable going on, let's say, bike infrastructure in the city, like a, a bike lane. I don't know how to negotiate that problem. That's level three. And then we have level four, which is what I mostly teach. Um, that's for people who either work for the city of Toronto or people who use a bicycle for their living or they just want to be safer cyclists in traffic. So what that one teaches is how to ride your bike essentially defensively in non-bike infrastructure. So if it's a main street like um, Young Street or Main Street, like Bay and so forth, how to navigate those kinds of streets that aren't exactly necessarily bike friendly. Um, and we go through, a, it's a 16 hour program. Uh, most of it's on the bike, though we have about four to five hours of instruction as well. This is just um, sort of lecture style instruction. The rest of it, it's on the road, teaching it on the road, going and going into essentially what could be dangerous if people didn't know what they were doing, but putting them in positions where um, they learn how to deal with fast traffic, how to deal with um, taking the lane, how to do it properly, um, 
how to where your positioning is, what to look for in traffic flow. Um, always constantly riding at least a meter from a curb or a meter from a car so they don't get doored because um, across Ontario, if you get doored, it's not considered a collision under the Highway Traffic Act. So it becomes very hard to um, get compensation in, in Toronto. It's incredibly hard to get the uh, the police to actually take it seriously. So, wow. yeah, so mm. dooring is a huge, huge issue. Um, and, you know, what Camp Bike can do is it teaches people how to avoid situations that might cause that. Um, of course, our mo motto is basically maneuverability, visibility, predictability, and communication, and VPC. And that's, that, in a nutshell, is what the whole Camp Bike program is. And we teach how you do that in all these situations. And that's also how you can evaluate um, if, an infra if the infrastructure that they're putting in is good. If it, if it can meet all of that, then you know, hey, that's great stuff. But if the one that they usually get wrong at, at times, um, and it's not just in Toronto, it's, I've seen it in Montreal, I've seen it in Hampton, I've seen it in Ottawa, the visibility part, sometimes the, the bike infrastructure just isn't set up so that the cyclist is visible to cars and at, in, at intersections. And that can be very problematic. But right, for uh, sure. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I've, I've seen a few nightmares, especially in Mississauga, where they do have a bi-directional trail along one of their busier roads. And um, I rarely take it in the opposite direction. I usually just go in the same direction as the traffic. But one, one day this year, after putting up a bike, um, actually a ghost plane, we're coming back and we took the trail, which we normally don't do. And we almost got left hooked about four or five times because um, the car drivers weren't looking and seeing if they were actually cyclists going eastbound, even though the cars themselves were on the other side of the road, but it's a six lane road, burning point. So they're on the clear other side of the road, trying to come over and make a turn. They don't see, they're not expecting to see a cyclist coming in that direction. So- Yeah. Wouldn't you just feel it. unnormal about that? Like unnatural to be, what? like you walk against the traffic, I get that, but I would feel comp so strange about biking against it over it's a like kilometer an hour uh, road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> scary yeah scary. so did you have that changed <laughs> uh we're we're trying to get that changed in mississauga so that's another city um that i don't live in but i do actually travel quite a bit into mississauga um and um the difference they have compared to trials because Everything is so wide and it's you know, a city that was mostly built in the 1980s and 90s. They have these wide, wide streets. So you can actually put bike infrastructure in there and still not take a lane of traffic. Uh, the fight in Toronto is when you put bike infrastructure in, um, you are quite often taking out a lane of traffic or you're taking a park. Oh, so, so it's getting used to um, sharing that space with yeah. bicycles. <laughs> Nah. So how does the the um the instruction work to become a coach? Because you're love so you coach level four and level four is like basically competent cyclists, but learning how to ride safely in the city. Um how does one become a an instructor like this? So I'm uh, interested. You, so you have to get level you have to get what's known as level five. Uh, so first of all, you have to have level four where you can even do it. And then you have to have sufficiently high enough marks on uh, level four that you can be um, an instructor will say, yes, this person's an instructor candidate. They can go ahead and take the course if they wanted to. And then we have a course usually twice a year um, in Toronto and also in Ottawa. Like we try to do it around uh, the problems. Um, but twice a year we have that course. Now, course... Uh, with the pandemic, we haven't really been doing much <laughs> with courses and stuff. And we're actually starting to run out of uh, instructors, so we do actually need them. But uh, once you get your level four, you take your level five. Level five is a 20 hour course. Most of it's um, about how to teach. We also look at um, how well you ride your bike, but uh, it's mostly how to teach cycling. So uh, we go over lots of scenarios about that. Um, it's kind of like um, coaching Canada. Um, so a lot of the principles that are in coaching Canada, uh, we also have I was going to ask about that because I have my level three national 
performance coaching certification through Coaching Canada. Um, so it's, it's similar to that, but you'd still have to take the camp like, yeah, level five. Right. Yeah, because I've been coaching. Yeah, you coaching like three. You, you'd you'd coach through uh, level five. Yeah, because I've been yeah I've been teaching stuff like this for like well not stuff not um how to ride in like around the city but how to ride your bike and ride with others like for 13 years uh yeah with my club so that's why it was kind of like oh I didn't realize they had or maybe I did because I've I have heard of cam bike and I, I remember looking at it uh, a number of years ago for the reason of like coaching outside of the club and different differently like how to how to survive the city which is uh invaluable information if um you could take it so are they starting up again this next year next summer uh, we're, we're hoping in toronto we are um in ottawa i don't know as as you know that um the city of ottawa no longer uh, the last time I checked, which was two months ago, uh, <laughs> Ottawa no, no longer uh, has a camp bike program. It's all done by private instructors like myself. Um, there's some kind of rip that happened in the last five years or so between the camp bike instructors and the city of Ottawa. So um, if you want to take camp bike, you'll have to look for the courses not on the uh, city of Ottawa website, but have to go to Camp Bike Canada's uh, website to see that. They have independent instructors teaching their own version of can bike here in ottawa yes is that what i'm hearing okay but can bike standard across the country so it's okay. they're following the same uh because we uh, one of our bigger subs is actually in vancouver okay well that makes sense makes sense right there so moving along now you all right let's just get into okay i have one more question the bike law ambassador how does that work and what is that? Okay, so Bike Law is a North American organization that essentially brings together um, like minded uh, lawyers. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but Patrick is a lawyer and I work with Patrick. Yes. Um, oh, I see. So um, brings together um, like minded lawyers and some of their staff or people that um, help out. Um, and uh, essentially, they're doing similar things to what ARC does. Um, they're trying to get laws changed. And in fact, um, in the United States, they're just very, uh, successful in getting a Bumble Road Users Act in, uh, West Virginia, sorry, in Virginia uh, just recently. And they're trying to get that in a few other jurisdictions. Uh, basically, what they do is they, um, they concentrate on liability. Um, they concentrate on trying to do personal injury uh, cases. And if it's a bicycle is involved, um, they take care of the cyclists. Uh, this formed because the founder of Bike Law, uh, Hugh Wilburn, his brother got killed 23 years ago. And they supposedly had the best lawyer in town for personal injury. And the guy goes, oh, why well, was this guy cycling? That's the kids. That's what the lawyer said to uh, Peter. So but you're fired. That, <laughs> yeah. Give me somebody else. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Just dropped my... Uh, my uh, keyboard here. Uh, <laughs> whoops. Oh, no. No, 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 no. You're I don't still know here. You hear okay. I can hear you. Give me, a se give me a second. That's okay. It looks there like you have quite go. the setup there, Joey. You're looking up and you're looking down. How many monitors do you have in front of you? Three. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have a second one. <laughs> oh, these guys. One, two, three. Like, yeah. I, well, sometimes I'm watching three or four streams at the same time. So. <laughs> like, how do you do that? You like, <laughs> eyeballs are like split in half. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it started when I was uh, watching sports back in the uh, 80s when we finally got, to, well, uh, my, my father was such a sports fan. We'd actually have two TVs, and then one of them had picture pictures, so we actually did three. We could watch three games simultaneously. Oh my God, you didn't in the eighties? <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so oh I'm my used God. to having multiple mo monitors. I mean, 
uh, one of my former professions is I used to be a television uh, editor. So um, that yeah. makes sense. You need so that. Wildcat Pro and Avid. I have one screen that would be uh, my bins and all that stuff. And the other, the other screen would be my timeline. So I, I'm, I haven't really used a single computer with just a single screen in about maybe 25 years. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I would love to migrate to a second screen. But I'm like, eh, I don't know if I'd be able to fit one here. So, all right. So you've been working with Pat on as a law ambassador, just, um, with advocating for their or giving advice. Is that kind of what I've had? Uh... Yeah, uh, I mean, with Pat, I mean, um, here in Ontario, we, we do, um, I mean, Pat was one of the people that uh, was behind trying to get that Bob Road Users Act uh, approved here in the, in the province. Um, he's more, that's his kind of thing, where he'll try to really go after legislation. Right. He's also very effective, um, lawyer in terms of getting stuff for his clients and um you know again being a bike lawyer he's involved in uh, a lot of the high um high visibility cases that are out before the courts right now uh in ontario so that's what he does and uh, what i might do is uh give some advice on um what i know about how cyclists might uh, are supposed to be cycling so if there's something coming up if the uh, other people the defendants are trying to throw up, hey, that cyclist wasn't cycling right or whatever. I can come back and if Patrick has a question, I can tell him, well, I can bike clean. This is how you'd probably do that. And more than likely, the cyclist was probably doing all right. Um, but my main job as an ambassador really is more just, as the name says, go out, ride in the community, wear the uh, clothing, mention that bike law exists. Um, you know, if you have any problems when you're cycling, you know, if you get hit by a car or someone opens the door on you, you know, these people exist, and uh, these this is who you should call. But and also occasionally uh, we do uh, group rides uh, as bike law in Toronto, so uh, helping raise funds for different causes. So it's it's a great little organization. Um, and again, I think their their work is terrific in the fact that they focus on cycling collisions and representing cyclists specifically as opposed to being just a general personal injury lawyer uh, company or firm. Uh, and again, they're also very much part of the community. And right now, you might have heard of the Waller Six in Texas. Uh, there was a group of six cyclists that um, uh, a 16 year old ran them over with, trying to roll coal. You heard that? Was that in Toronto? Because we had something that happened here. Um, God been years now probably 10 where five cyclists got run over early in the morning on march road but where did this in incident happen uh just outside of houston texas oh so this was a rolling so the backstory is a kid tried to roll coal that's where you have a diesel truck and you change the emission system on the truck that allows it to put up black black smoke from the exhaust it's in, it's incompletely um, burned fuel, and so the kid was trying to scare the cyclists and roll coal. In fact, he actually hit the cyclists. None of them died. Uh, two were sent to an um, uh, emergency, like in very critical condition, but they all survived. So, anyways, bike law uh, has been representing them, and they've made sure that the investigation wasn't swept under the table because in Waller, um, the kid came from a prominent family. And initially, the police department was trying to sweep it over, but they got one of the, um, uh, they got they sent the equivalent of the um, Crown Prosecutor to come in and do a proper uh, investigation on it. And so charges are now, um, have been, um, they had actually laid charges, it took them a while, about six weeks. But um, yeah, they, that's what they've done. That's what Bike Law has been good at. They've been going, whether it was in Houston or in Toronto or in Virginia or North Carolina or in Florida, they're very prominent in getting, making sure they're fighting for cyclists' uh, rights through, through law, whether it's criminal or if it's. Uh, so they're, it's a great organization. So if anybody has like an incident that happened to them where they think that it's not going to be 
uh, properly dealt with or um, investigated, they can reach out to bike law and bring them in. Yeah. Oh, wow. The earlier, the, earlier the, the better. Um, and the fact yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the six, I think three of them knew, like correctly knew people in bike law. So uh, they, they immediately got in contact. But, um, and, and that was a great thing because if they had, um, I doubt that um, the driver would have been tracked, criminally tracked. That's really good information to know because often things like that are swept underneath the, you know, underneath the carpet and kind of forgotten and, you know, people just sort of, you know, let it go. But bike law, everyone. Now, where can you find a lot of these um, contacts are for, let's start with bike law. Is there a website for that, uh, yes, Joey? Bike law, bike law .ca. There you go, bike law .ca. That's pretty easy. Can't forget that one. The next one is can bike. Uh, can bike is can bike .ca. <laughs> can dash bike though. Is it? Uh, oh no, it's can bike Canada .ca. Okay. Does that sound right? Yeah. That's so Andrew. Arc. Uh, with Arc, uh, just go to our Facebook. Um, you can search for us as Respect for. Uh, first of all, our website is respect.org. Sorry, uh, respectcyclist.org. Uh, and on Facebook, just uh, just look for uh, advocacy for respect for cyclists, and you'll be able to find us. And that's our main platform for actually communicating. All right. Perfect. Well, we've got. Is there anything left, Joey, that we should know that's currently happening or new to happen in the Toronto area in the next year that you want to share? Sure. Um, in the next year or so, uh, Toronto is actually upgrading probably the busiest uh, piece of cycling infrastructure we have in the city. Uh, these are the old college uh, street uh, bike lanes. And um, I remember correctly, um, Jack Layton was still a city councilor when those were put in back in the very early 1990s. Um, so they haven't really been upgraded since then. Um, uh, they're going to make those into cycle tracks as much as they can. And uh, they're also going to uh, try to make a few other streets uh, connect with that. So the idea here is that it's going to connect some of the cycling infrastructure that we now have. Uh, so we have new cycling infrastructure on University Avenue, a cycle track. We have um, more bike lanes on board, uh, sorry, on Bay than we've ever had. Uh, so it's going to connect to that. And they're going further west into the city. So hopefully um, in a couple of years, and it's really dependent on when they're redoing streetcar tracks. Um, once the tracks go all the way to Lansdowne, uh, we'll be able to actually connect all the, um, the bike infrastructure in that area, including the West Toronto Rail Path. So ideally, probably in about what, five years or so, hopefully. That'll be all connected up. The rail, the rail path, College Street, College, and the other major um, uh, bike lanes and cycle tracks. Wow! That's, that's so one of the big things that's happened. That is pretty huge. So Toronto is now going to become a cycling-friendly city. So that if I go there, I'll actually think of bringing my bike and thinking that I could stay downtown and cycle safely around and don along the lakeshore. Around Lakeshore, we can do that now. I mean, Lakeshore has the Martin Goodman Trail, which is part of the Trans Canada Trail. But um, this is more downtown, um, major routes. So it's great for um, people who are using bicycles as a means of transportation, as opposed to recreation. Um, it's not bad for recreation. Um, but the hard part is we're not really doing much out in the burbs. And when we try to do stuff in, let's say, Scarborough, which is a uh, uh, Toronto's most eastern internal suburb. Uh, we haven't had much success. I mean, we just recently had a, a bike lane that we put in last year for active TO. It lasted six months before the local council. Lasted six had it months. Uh, yeah, so really? Got, yeah, the council had it ripped. Out. We're about the only jurisdiction I know of that we can't, you know, that we ripped out bike lanes. I think this is the third <laughs> one that we ripped out of Scarborough. Who day. does that? Uh, very car centric people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would say suburbs is probably the probably where you want to put the energy because as it grows, I mean, 
It's just like Ottawa. You know, it takes longer and longer for us to get out of the city as cyclists. And then it, and also, you know, it provides, it's it's not as safe, right? Because it takes us longer to get out to the safeness of the, you know, the, the, the country and things like that. So. Well, that's a huge issue in Toronto. So again, as a random yeah. year, I mean, if I go on a 400K ride, uh, just the, like what used to be the country uh, oh. 10 years ago is now a metropolis. So uh, my example would be in um, uh, Vaughan, the city of Vaughan uh, was relatively small uh, 10 years ago. Now it's got 300,000 people. It had maybe 100,000 that um, 10 years ago. So, and what that meant is uh, on some streets like Keel and Jane, they've actually gone from being farmland for kilometers on end to now um, we're almost got complete development all the way up to where we normally call the country, like our major east, west, north, south country lanes or roads. Uh, they're being um, just consumed by all this development. So development is a huge, urban sprawl is a huge issue. Uh, and that's one of the things cycling can help. But at the moment, um, we have a very pro-developer provincial government that's um, making sure it's a lot easier for uh, that sprawl to continue. That's one of the reasons um, probably we'll be helping fighting uh, Highway uh, 413 and that new Brantford cutoff, which is ridiculous. It goes right through the Hallmark. That's prime cycling area, as well as, of course, prime farmland. Um, that will probably destroy our country route in that area. Uh, there's both the Randomir and Tron Bicycling Network have several um, several rides and several routes in that area that would be heavily impacted by that. So yeah, it's getting harder and harder every year to get out into the country from the city. Uh, in fact, with the Tron Bicycling Network, what they finally did is they created something called Country Cruises. So you have to have a car. So you have they have their starts in actual country, but you might have to you might have to drive an hour and a half just to get to the start point. Um, yeah. and I don't own a car. I don't intend to ever own a car again. Um, and that's kind of antithetical to cycling, but we're getting to the point where it's not necessarily safe, potentially, to go from where you live in, in the downtown or even if you live in a suburb to get to the starting point for these longer rides out of the country. So that, that's yeah, I found, I found that too, like our, uh, our leaders are starting further out of the city um, just so that you can get out into the country and quite frequently quite often you have to drive to a start but then also for us it's another way of um you know just experiencing a different route and um it's not so much a like we aren't complaining about it yet it's not that far out of town um and we still have lots of stuff that start in the city but it it was much more frequent this summer, I have to say, within our club. <laughs> but a lot of people love the routes, right? They, you go to little villages that are further out of the city. If you want to start in the city, it's like, you know, like 60K to get there, but you drive 20K out. So then it's 40 and back and then it's kind of doable and uh, for some people. But, but yeah, that's really interesting. So... We're going to, so we got all of our links. And before we go, um, Joey, would you like people to follow you on on a social media platform for more information or just to watch sure. your, what you're up to? Uh, if you want, uh, I mean, I'm on Facebook. <laughs> uh, so just Joey Schwartz. I think I'm Joey S1, if I remember correctly on Facebook. Um, and I'm not really terribly active on Twitter, but I do have an account there as well. Um, and uh, I think I'm Joey S4B on Twitter. So, so we'll put those in the show there. notes. Yeah. And what we're going to do is we're going to have Joey come back and talk about randoneering. Just so we'll keep the two separate because yeah. that, and maybe you might want to bring a couple like friends to, to chat about this because it's, it's uh, I haven't heard a lot about it in Ottawa, but it sounds like it's, um, very busy and and uh like ottawa i heard was small it was a small randoneering it wasn't very but but that's a long time ago like i was mentioning and um and so 
you know, maybe we can get a chat going on with you and a couple of friends um, for the podcast and talk about the randoneering world. Because I think that would be cool. Oh, yeah. Totally I get a lot, uh, quite, quite a few folks there. And actually, uh, well, I mean, we are a small club in, in terms of our OCA, Ontario Cycling Association. I think we're one of the smaller clubs. Um, but, you know, we do have uh, at least 20 members in Ottawa. Um, huh. And, you know, I think overall, I think we have maybe 120 all together in uh, the three chapters. Toronto being the biggest, but we also have the Huron, Huron Ontario or Huron and Windsor area. Um, that's pretty big too. So, cool. so we're going to um, save that for another uh, another time. And uh, yeah, do, do you mind coming back? Oh, no. That'd be that'd be great. That'd be, that'd be easier to talk about, I'm sure. <laughs> we'd share about all your tips and tricks on that. So. With that, thank you so much, uh, Joey, for coming out and sharing with us what's going on in the Toronto area with regards to um, cycling infrastructure and the organizations that are happening there. And for everyone else, thank you so much for listening. Super grateful. Don't forget to uh, subscribe and follow, uh, not to mention share this podcast with somebody you might know who would enjoy it. With that, have an amazing day and thanks again, Joey. Thank you. Bye for now.